Hey guys, welcome back to Girl We Gotta Talk. In today's episode, I talked to Haley Kovaleski, who is an LA-based millennial and Gen Z money coach. So she came on to answer all of your questions that you guys sent in about debt, how to budget, how to save, investing your money, um, tips on buying a house, and just how to be financially smart. So she really gave the best tips on all of these and I personally learned a lot in this episode. Um, I feel like when we grow up, we don't learn too much about finance and how to sort of handle it all once we are in the real world. So I found this episode really helpful and I hope you guys do too. Also, just a quick reminder to follow Girl We Gotta Talk podcast on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, and go ahead and give me a follow on TikTok, at Elena Jakes. I'm starting to make more content on there, and it's been really fun, so definitely go give that a follow and check it out for sure. And if you like episodes every Wednesday and you enjoy the episodes you're hearing, definitely leave me a review on Apple Podcasts. I would love to hear from you guys, um, and your feedback means the world to me. So anyways, let's jump into today's episode because girl, we got to talk. Hello, hello, and welcome back to Girl, We Gotta Talk. Today, I'm joined by Haley Kovaleski, who is joined to help us with all finance-related topics today. You guys wrote in a ton of questions for her about loans, debt, budgeting, how to save, how to invest, all great questions. So she is going to answer those today. But Haley, welcome to today's podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. I'm so excited for this because I was saying earlier, we... I feel like our generation was just, and I'm sure like pretty much every generation isn't really taught a ton about this. Like when they grow up, it's like you have one little finance class, at least for me. And then you're like shoved out into the world and you're like expected to know all this stuff. So I'm excited to learn from you today. Real quick though, I have some rapid fire questions that are just random just to get to know you a little bit better and we'll jump in. So, okay, real quick, describe yourself in three words. Ooh, okay. <laughs> Let's see. Um, I don't know. I'm very relaxed, like chill, I would say, um, but ambitious because I like to, to work really hard. And then the third one is I'm, I'm kind, like I really believe in treating people with respect and being a good person. So I would, I would go with those three. Oh, I love those. What yeah, was your good. first job? My first job um was back when I was 12 I think like 11 or 12 and I worked at a um, we had like a what is it called not like, like I don't know like a park with like baseball diamonds and stuff and I worked in like the snack bar there so I was it was kind of like a mini 7-eleven I was like making hot dogs and coffee and slushies and snow cones and like s- stuff and it was all under the table so I'd get paid in cash and it was like this huge big deal for me and then babysat of course but that was my first like job um yeah oh that's so fun um and then where is your happy place my happy place so I live in LA I would say happy place is always by outside or by water um yeah I, I just love being outside um so any anything in nature Okay, cool. So if you want to kind of introduce like what you do for a living and um, talk about like your page a little bit before we jump into everything and sort of introduce you. Sure. So, so the, my page, my business, my side business is actually like exactly that it's a side business in my nine to five. I actually haven't even announced this anywhere. I'm actually in between jobs right now. I put in my notice at my last job and I'm starting a new job on the 21st. And I do, my last job was recruiting for like a, a nine to five. I was like a headhunter for a recruiting firm. Um, and I worked primarily in the consumer goods industry, primarily within beauty and wellness. And then um, my new job will be recruiting, but in tech, and I won't say the name of it, but it's a big tech company. Um, and um, so that's a little bit about what I do in my nine to five. And then my side business is a, all about finance coaching, primarily for millennials, Gen Z, um, targeted more, I would say, towards women, LGBTQ um, plus, and then uh, people of color, I would say, I want to help more marginalized groups of people have access to financial literacy and the steps to help get them ahead. 
That's awesome. Well, congrats on the new job. That's very exciting. I'm kind of unemployed right now and it's been the best. Like I wish I could do this for months and just like relax. <laughs> I, I recommend if you're starting a new job, try to push your start date out as far as you can, if you can a- afford to, because it's been really nice having this time. Oh, I bet. Like a little mini vacation before you jump yep. into it again. You need like the mental break. I love it. Cool. So we have some questions here. Um, I kind of, I tried to like section them off based on the topic because we had a lot of similar ones come in about budgeting and how to save and then a lot of um, investing questions. So I've kind of broken them up into different sections. So we'll, I guess we'll just start with debt and loans. Um, Very exciting. I got a question here. It says, is it best to refinance your loans or pay them every month? Um, Really good question. It really depends person to person. Like it depends on how big the loan is and like the timeline. I would say if you have a lot of loans that are really high interest rates, potentially look at refinancing. But if it's just like one big one loan that has like a higher interest rates and the rest are a little bit lower, just buckle down, focus paying off that loan that has a higher interest rate. And then, um, then you can go into your other loans and, 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 um, take it from there. But refinancing is really person to person. Again, it really depends on the, the interest rate on the loan. Okay. Gotcha. And the next question is my student loans never seem like they're going down. What's the best way to uh, pay them off? Should I just do bigger payments each month? So that kind of goes along with the last one, I guess, with refinancing and sort of like being able to pay those off. Yeah, it does. Um, And I would say too, with that is you want to be a little bit organized in your strategy of how you pay off your student loans too. So right now, federal student loans are paused. So maybe you're paying off private, but if if you're not getting charged an interest rate right now on your student loans, what some people are doing is they're building up that um, student loan kind of bucket in a uh, online savings account where they're like a high yield savings account where they're earning some extra interest on it um, as opposed to paying it off right now because they are paused. Um, but what I would do if, I, if you have student loans is you want to just sit down, write them all down with their corresponding interest rates and then um, organize it to potentially pay off the ones that have that, those higher interest rates first. So that'll help um, kind of like having a plan because if you don't have a plan it does feel like they're they're never going away but if you have a plan you can kind of get on top of it and it'll help yeah I love that and I feel like writing it out and looking at it all at once is probably going to be very helpful because I know with me it's like it's all in my brain and I'm like that stresses me out I'm a person that like has to see it visually and like be able to break it down that way so I love that Um, We have some questions about budgets and savings. So um, this first question said, what is the best way to establish a budget? Like how would I start doing this and what are your best budgeting tools? Great question. So budgeting, some people absolutely love it. And they're like little budgeting freaks. They write down every little thing. Other people like me, I don't love budgeting, but I know how important and powerful it is. So a really quick, like method if you've never budgeted before maybe you've heard of this is the 50 30 20 rule and again it comes down to what it means is 50 percent of your income going towards your needs like your rent your groceries your um i don't know some debt that you have to pay right your minimum payments on that and 30 percent going towards fun wants like you don't want to just you know not ever spend money on yourself like i want you to get your mind in a good place so that's where the 30 percent needs or sorry wants come in like entertainment, that kind of deal trips. And then 20% ideally towards savings future you. Um, That's a really good way to start. If you're hearing this and you're like 20% savings, that seems impossible. Start with 1% and 5% work your way up um, because it's all a process, right? So um, that, and then I personally have a budget planner, kind of like a Google Sheets, Excel kind of deal that I use for planning out my money, but people really like Mint a lot. I would just say the best thing that you can do when it comes to your finances is just don't ignore them. A lot of people just ignore them, but take one to three months where you track everything. This might sound kind of crazy, but when you track, start tracking your expenses, you'll start noticing like where your money's actually going and see habits in your spending that maybe you didn't know before, see things that you can cut. Like you're like, you don't even realize every single time you go out, you like grab something from the convenience store or whatever. You maybe didn't even notice about that about yourself. Yeah, I think that's a good point to consider because for me, I feel like 
I recently, <laughs> I realized that I have all of these little like Apple pay, Spotify, all the streaming services are like the monthly payments that are just being pulled out of my account. And I don't, that doesn't go in my head of like, I'm losing that money each month. So I realized it a couple of months back. I'm like, oh my gosh, I need to keep track of like those little payments because they seem little, obviously they're like a couple bucks. But then when you look at it overall, you're like, oh my God, I'm losing like a good amount of money each month from all of this. So I feel like that's a really good tip and people don't always like think of that. So subscriptions is huge. It gets a lot of people and same thing with gifts. Like as women, we don't realize how much we buy for other people. Like our partners are like picking them up stuff like, oh, my partner would like this or some, my friend would like that. So those are little things too. You start noticing about yourself when you track your finances for a, for a couple months. Yeah. And then this question said, how do you discipline yourself when budgeting? Like, um, obviously it's difficult to like control your spending when maybe you are a big spender, but, um, I guess finding that 50, 30, 20 is, I guess, part of that, but do you have any other tips in order to like discipline yourself there? I have two trip, two tips and I'll try to remember them. First thing is identify your why, like, why are you even trying to save or invest at And then the second thing that helps with being a little bit more disciplined in your spending is this is for those like impulse shoppers, like people who are buying stuff off the internet or at TJ Maxx, home goods. Like that's where my guilt free thing is. Yeah. (laughs) It's asked is you want to add an extra step in between before that purchase. So you want to ask yourself, like, what like problem am I trying to solve by buying this item? You know, why am I buying this item? And by like thinking about it just one step further, you're like, oh, do I really need this? Or is it more of just like an impulse buy? And I guess the third thing, this really helps too with my impulse spenders that are are clients of mine is I say, just leave it in your cart, you know, for like 24 hours. If you're still thinking about it after 24 hours, maybe it was something you really wanted, but it's those seconds of like, oh, and so many ads are do so good of like, buy this right now kind of thing. So just like set it, leave it alone for a day. And if you still want it, okay, maybe you, you really did want it. Yeah, that's definitely something that I've learned over the last like couple of months, especially like within quarantine, I was like, I mean, Amazon is just so simple and I would be like, okay, let me keep it in my cart. Like you said, and if tomorrow or a couple of days from now, I still want it, like maybe I'll do it because it is like, I feel like with online shopping, that's so tricky because it's a form of like a pastime. Like you're just on your phone scrolling, like you're not thinking about it and you want to buy, buy, buy. So I think that's a really good tip. Like let it marinate a little bit. Think about it. Yeah. A couple days from now. Hey guys, today's episode is brought to you by Omeo. Omeo is a travel booking platform that makes planning a journey in Europe and North America effortless. Just enter your travel details and Omeo will magically give you all of the train, bus, flight, and ferry options for your journey. It's never been simpler to book your first real vacation for 2021. Best of all, using Omeo saves you time and money, so that is a win-win. Omeo wants to help you leave your house this summer by offering 5% off your next booking, so head to omeo.com and use the code LISTENER5 at checkout, and this is valid until the 30th of June for all new users on modes of transport. It's just the pick-me-up 2021 needs. The next question we had is, can you talk about savings account versus savings account versus high-yield savings account? Yeah. So what high yield savings accounts are, if you don't know, is basically banks pay you literal pennies to bank with them. And I'm talking like your Chase, your Wells Fargo, your Bank of America, right? Um, There are online high yield savings accounts such as Marcus by Goldman Sachs and Ally Bank that'll pay their clients like you and me more money to bank with them. There, it's known as the, like the interest rate that they pay you is known as APY, annual percentage yield. This is this number fluctuates. That's something that people don't know. Pre-COVID, it was at 2.5%. So I made like hundreds of dollars off of my savings account by having a high yield savings. Now, because it's based off of the Fed and the Fed's lowered interest rates due to COVID to try to stimulate the economy, these interest rates are lower. But I still think it's nice having a little separation between your checking account, which is in your normal bank, like your Chase, whatever, and your savings account. Um, Marcus, for example, has like same day transfers. Ally Bank, I think it takes three days to get your money out of your savings and back into your checking, which is also kind of nice because it makes you really think further about that spending. So the ideal idea of the high yield savings account is to build up your emergency fund in one of these or where you're saving for a big purchase, like I know car down payment, because it's going to pay you more money to for the in these banks, basically. Um, and then you can set up buckets like 
I struggle making really big purchases. Like I have no furniture right now. I've had a furniture sinking fund or furniture bucket for the past eight months since I was knew I was going to be moving. And I'm like, shoot, I need to start saving for furniture because having that all on my credit card is like, gives me a little bit of heart palpitation. So I had this extra money in this savings bucket with my high yield savings. It was making me money while I was saving for my future furniture. I just bought everything, transferred the money out, paid off the credit card right away. Okay. Yeah. And I guess in order to start it, it's just reaching out to those banks that offer that kind of service. How would you get super easy? Literally go to so, so easy. Literally you need your account number and your routing number from your bank. And you would just go to like ally.com or ally bank or Google Marcus by Goldman Sachs, high yield savings account, open it. And that's it. It's really easy. Perfect. Okay. Um, another question what is the importance of the 401k? I know I need to be saving, but what is the real importance of a retirement plan? So the importance is, I guess, big picture is we have a retirement savings crisis, especially for women in the US. Like women are not saving their money to the extent that men are or investing to the extent. And this is when you see like you go grocery shopping, right? You see like an older woman checking your bags. And, and bagging your groceries for you. And it's because w- w- they've run out of money. Like historically women's salaries peak earlier than men's do. We take more career breaks, maybe to have families than men. And we live longer than men too, right? So the importance of a 401k or a Roth IRA is to, is to create this huge basket of money for yourself by the time you retire or become work optional. Because I don't, we don't wanna see grandma Elena bagging groceries. Nobody wants to see that, right? We want yeah. you to be taking this time for yourself. Um, and so the government offers a tax break for these um, retirement accounts. So for the 401k, you get a tax break now, you pay taxes later when you take the money out. The Roth IRA, you pay taxes now, you've paid taxes on the money that's going in, but then that money grows tax-free, you take it out tax-free after 59 and a half. They're trying to incentivize us to save for retirement by give, offering these tax breaks, which is why these accounts are so powerful. And then um, I had something else to say on those, but I guess I forgot. So it's really important to start contributing to these as soon as you can, especially if you have an employer 401k with a match, because that match, I want your mind to go immediately to free money. If your employer has a match, they're saying, if you put in 3%, which is where our match is, you get 3% of your salary, free money for you to go towards your retirement or whatever. So that's the importance of these accounts. Like they're very, very powerful um, accounts. Oh, and the la- what I was going to say is, I hate how it's called saving for retirement. It's not a savings account. It, I wish it was called investing for retirement because you're putting money in, you're choosing what you want it to invest in, and then it's going to compound and grow and become more and more powerful. So the earlier you start these, like, and the more that you can put into it directly correlates to the earlier you can become work optional. Okay, perfect. Yeah, that's interesting that you say that about women. I think that um, that's not something that I've ever thought of, but great point and very important to be doing that, I think. Yes. Um, So we had some questions come in on investing your money. So the first one was, what is the real importance of investing your money and how can I really start doing this? So the importance of investing obviously is to, um, it's it's because we want to like outweigh inflation. So the dollar loses about 2% of its value every single year just by sitting in your bank account. When the market, like the market can return on average, it says like it's returned about 10% for the past like 100 years. So you're trying to outweigh inflation and increase the value of your money and put it to work. So like that's the importance of investing is to make your money work as hard as you do by investing in these companies that have historically given more return for, for your money, basically. What was the second part of the question? How can I start doing this? You can start with, again, your employer 401k. That's investing right there. A lot of people are like, oh, I haven't started investing. But when you have a 401k, that is, again, it's investing. Or Roth IRA is really powerful. So the rule of, there's kind of like an, an, an order that you want to be investing in is we want to be taking advantage of these tax-advantaged accounts first, your 401k and your Roth. Like I feel like 2020 and even leading into, 20, leading into 2021 a little bit, the like investing's been the buzzword, especially with all the GameStop stuff and, and crypto stuff. And it's like, it's kind of been on everybody's radar, but you, and you probably know so many of your friends are like, oh, I opened up a Robinhood account. Like Robinhood's a great, it's, it's a really easy way to invest, but it doesn't offer that tax advantage investing. So we want, we want to 
prioritize that a little bit after we do our 401k and a Roth IRA where you get your tax only at one point. So easy ways to start investing is um, 401k, Roth IRA, and then the easiest way of all is just look up Robo Advisor. They charge a little bit of a fee, but they'll put, do, make your portfolio for you. They'll, they'll balance it for you based on your income, your age, when you want this money by. Um, they primarily invest it in low cost ETFs, index funds kind of, kind of deal. So ETFs, um, I go into a lot of this stuff on my page and in my coaching, but it's basically like baskets of stocks and securities that have historically had pretty consistent returns. Okay. Awesome. And the next one was, um, mm-hmm. is investing in stocks, a smart move in your twenties? Very smart move. Very smart move. Cause it's all about time in the market, not about trying to time the market. So the earlier you can get in the longer you can leave your money alone, the better for, for it basically. So, I mean, you can run the numbers, but people are like, oh, if you invest like $5,000 at 18 and you don't and invest, so you would invest like $5,000 by the time you're 18 and then just a hundred dollars a month every day after that, you're going to make, have like, I think it was like 1.8 million by the time you retire versus if you don't start until you're like in your thirties or forties, you have a significant less, even if you invest more than that person who started at eight, at 18. Now we can't go back and start at 18. Like I didn't start investing until I think like 24, 25, I'm 27 now. So maybe it's like 23, 24. Um, but um, again, just get in the habit, start investing, buy some shares in companies, you know, buy some shares in companies you don't know, see how you feel when the market's down versus when it's up, you know, like notice your feelings that come up when this happens. And then as you're doing this, like get more comfortable with it, do more research, and then start buying again, more funds that have maybe historically made more money, things like that. So there's a lot of ways you can go with it, but just start small is basically what I'm trying to say and work your way up. Okay, cool. The next question is how much do you need to buy a home? Like the down payment, closing costs, et cetera. It is a really good question. And I actually, next week I'm having like a whole theme of like what it takes to buy a home. I'm partnering with a woman who is a real estate agent. So if people want to hear, we're doing a live next Thursday too. Um, cause I don't know the entire process of buying a home. I live in Southern California. I think buying a home is a little bit far fetched or it will take a long time. Um, but a couple of things that you can do first off, look, do run the numbers, right? It, like there's been so much research done about the extra costs involved in buying a home. Like you have your HOA costs. Like you said, you have your co- closing costs. You have to buy all the furniture that goes in the home, which is really expensive. Right. And then you're stuck in that location. Is that location somewhere you want to be for the next X amount of years? Um, so there's a lot of extra costs that go into buying a home, like maintenance stuff as well. But when it comes down, comes to it. So there's, a couple of things. First off, the recommendation of how much to put down is 20% plus again, count for closing costs. So it really depends. You have to look at comps in the area of the home that you want to buy then do the math. Okay. Maybe a home is $350,000 or whatever times 0.2. That's how much we're going to be putting down potentially and then add in more. Um, but there are other loans like the first time homeowners loan where you only have to put down like three to 5%. Um, so it's, it really depends. Um, you got to look again into all of that. So. Okay. I'm not an, I'm not a real estate expert though. Well, this will, um, be out on Wednesday so people can definitely join your live the next day and cool. learn more. Yeah. Perfect. Um, we had a question come in. It says, how important is it to have multiple streams of income? It's important. I saw a good analogy just today. There were like, I don't know, they had like four toilet paper, like tubes, and then like a, a notepad on top. And they, they said for the, for, for one, there was actually only one tube and the notepad on top. And they're like, this is the, the tube is your stream of income. If we take it off, then the notepad falls. Right. But if you have four streams of income, one tube falls away or whatever, you still have these other three legs holding up your table. So it's really like at the beginning, when you're in your early twenties, not a lot of people are thinking of like, how do I have multiple streams of income? You know, it's really hard to build up. I would say focus early twenties on trying to add as much value as you can in your position. And so that you can move up, maybe get a raise early on and have more income coming in earlier on. And then start again, trying to add in other streams of income, investing is a stream of income, um, side hustles. And when I talk side hustles is another big buzz, buzz term, right? 
And people are like, what side hustle can I do? Like you're starting a podcast, right? Don't look outward, look inward. What are you naturally good at? You know, you don't have to turn every hobby into something that makes money, but there are very easy ways to make extra money. And it doesn't have to be so much like $200 a month and which you then invest goes so far can lead to so much return 500. Oh my gosh. $500 a month extra can is like life changing too, whether you invest it or, or not. So you don't have to have a side hustle or whatever, another income that makes so much money, but something even just as little as 200 extra dollars a month is really powerful. Yeah, absolutely. This next question says, what are the steps to take now in my twenties just to set myself up in the best way for down the line? which I feel like we've kind of covered this entire time, but maybe yeah. just like to sum it up there. The only thing I would add is we already talked about like work hard while you're at work in your twenties, explore. Like if you don't like your job, it's okay. Like right now, especially the economy is so like, it doesn't feel like it's so good. Like it's so, it feels like it's still uncertain, but there's so many great companies hiring. If you've been thinking about making them, I was just going to say network. Like you never know who you're working with, who might become potentially like your, your way into a net, your next company. Or, um, so I would just say like, the, again, it's, it's hard to tell now, like when you're in your first job or whatever, that's where I guess a lot of your audience is, but you don't know, like these people that you're coming up with now are going to be there throughout your entire career. You're going to be keeping in tabs on where they're going, what companies they're at. And you want to like make I don't want to say like, like, you know, it has to be natural, of course, but, but make connections where people are going to say your name in a room that you're not even in are going to volunteer you for like these amazing opportunities that you're, you didn't even think of like that you weren't even aware of. Like I have connections that I've made on Instagram where I had like these amazing companies reach out and they're like, do you have know any other accounts um, that are similar to yours and people who treat me well, who I've built relationships with, I'm saying their names. They didn't even ask me to, you know, so things like that like people can open up a lot of doors and opportunities for you. So I would just say, treat people well, work hard while you're at work, have a positive attitude and never know what opportunities that can, can come from it. I think that's great advice. I wanted to ask you to kind of wrap things up here. Um, what do you wish that you knew when you were in your very, very early twenties, like right out of college and like navigating the world um, of finance and stuff? Like, what do you wish that you knew and what would you tell yourself? What do I wish I knew when it came to finances? I would just say like something that I didn't know was I didn't know just to like write down my numbers. Like, you know, you have your gross income, like my first paying job out of college, I was making 55 grand, but what was my take home? I don't know. Like I wasn't writing down my exact like take home and what all my expenses were. Like I like even if you just do a really rough thing one time, like it's really powerful. And then the next thing I wish I knew was to take advantage of these tax advantage accounts, like the 401k and Roth. It took me a while to start up a Roth. I wish I started it earlier. Now I make too much to contribute. I have to do other things for it. Like, um, I again, I wish I took advantage of, of some of these first and um, just started a little bit earlier. But, oh, I, and the last thing I would just say is, like there's so many amazing resources available. Um, there's books, there's YouTube, there's podcasts. So take advantage of all that. It's the easiest now than ever before in history to learn something new. Absolutely. And your page is one of them. So where can people find you? Where can people contact you if they're interested in um, your coaching, all of that good stuff? So yeah, you, they can DM me on Instagram. So my um, handle is at Fem Financial Coaching. My website's there. Um, so just any questions, it's very, it's non-judgmental at all. Finance should be non-judgmental, judgmental. It's open to, you know, everyone's background and there's no dumb questions. Like everybody starts off as a beginner. So, um, if you just want to learn and do it like with, with these topics, some of these topics are a little bit, um, I don't know, expansive, but I, but what makes my coaching really good is I'm able to break them down and make them very digestible. So if you just need a little extra handholding, then it's a really good um, option for you to get started. Yeah, absolutely. And I feel like you answered all these questions so well. I hope that this was beneficial for people. I'm sure it was. So thank you for taking the time today to answer them and join me. Um, be sure to follow Haley on the socials that she just mentioned. I'll link everything um, so you can check her out for sure. But thank you so much for joining me, Haley. And last thing, I'm on TikTok too, just at fem underscore financial.
check Perfect. it out because my I go into a lot of detail on a lot of these topics there too. Okay. Perfect. Yes. Follow her on TikTok as well. Awesome. Good for you. Well, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me.